Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. <coughs> but, to, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners will do that. And if you lend to those to whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given unto you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is the word of the Lord, my friend. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, it's tradition that we Presbyterians say the Lord's Prayer when we do say it, to forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Not only is it tradition, but the most literal translation of the words from Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, which is where Jesus teaches the disciples the Lord's Prayer. As you know, the Gospels were originally written in Greek, with a little bit of Aramaic thrown in to catch some of the nuances. Now the Greek word used in this verse from Matthew is ophelema, and the dictionary definition is that which is old or a debt. So in this prayer, the thing that we are asking forgiveness for is literally our debts. Now the understanding of debts through much of history for those both in biblical times and today is not only encompassed by ideas of owing money. A debt can be any kind of obligation. It is just that it is easier to understand when we can quantify it in terms of money. In common parlance, we might say to someone who helps us that, I'm indebted to you. In a court of law, a suit can be brought against someone where we literally try to quantify the harm that has been done to someone. And the restitution that is ruled upon becomes a debt. So when we talk about forgiving debts, we really do also mean sins and trespasses. When I was in high school, my dad was in the military, and we moved around quite a lot. So my siblings and I often jumped from school to school, places where we knew no one. We had to acclimate ourselves over and over again. Well, on one particular day, when we had just gotten to a new school, between classes I was walking down an unfamiliar and crowded hallway, carrying a couple of books in my arm, and in spite of my uncertainty, I was trying hard to look and act as if I belonged right there. Of course, I was wearing my bell-bottom jeans <laughs> and a silky shirt. My hair was meticulously combed over my ears because I thought I had large-looking ears. Don't tell me if they are or not. <laughs> and I wore those black plastic glasses because I was nearsighted and black plastic glasses were the cheapest things on the rack. But I am sure the determined look on my face 
and my stylish clothes fooled no one. I must have appeared an easy mark for anyone who wanted my milk money. During that transit between locker and classroom, I was stopped by a girl who was in one of my classes. And she said, hey, can I borrow a quarter? I was a little nonplussed because uh, that was the first time a girl had talked to me in a hallway in that school. <laughs> and I didn't have much time to think because, you know, I had to be getting to class there. So I turned the quarter over to her when she had promised to pay me back the next day. <clears throat> well, I went out and went to class, and then when I went to lunch, of course, I had no milk money, so I had to eat my sandwich dry. So, but I was still a little disconcerted about the incident. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure you know what's coming next. The next day, I stopped her in the hall and asked her about this debt that she owed me, and she responded, what quarter? What quarter? Can you imagine that? Well, I stammered for a moment and tried to get her to recall the transaction that we had had the day before, as if there was some hope that I would ever get that quarter back in my pocket. <clears throat> well, you know, the loss of that quarter hurt me every time I saw that girl in the hallway. And I think it aggravated me because I felt embarrassed at having allowed myself to be taken advantage of, and that was what bothered me probably more than anything else. And looking back on the incident, I still wonder what she spent that quarter on. But more, I realize how my reaction, my holding on to the anger in this case, hurt me far more than if she had taken every cent I had and kicked me in the shins to boot. In truth, I was hurting myself by not forgiving this girl for that minuscule amount that she had taken from me. But I also had trouble forgiving myself for being so naive. Now, you do not have to tell me how petty all of this sounds. I cringe just to tell you about it. But I think it illustrates a point. And that is, in the grand scheme of things, almost any perceived offense against us by someone else is not worthy, worth holding a grudge over. It's not worth beating ourselves up over. Because that is what's happening when we hold a grudge. We feel we need to meet out some retribution and get back to something someone has taken from us. We are allowing our offended selves to obsess on something that has hurt us and therefore it continues to hurt us. By forgiving our debtors, we write off the loss or the injury that has been afflicted upon us and we move on with a clean ledger. We don't have to feel anger or embarrassment every time we are reminded of this or that incident. So forgiveness sounds like some practical advice for those living in the here and now, doesn't it? Sometimes we tend to think of the teachings of Jesus as being this pie-in-the-sky pronouncements that are only going to benefit us in the long run. And truthfully, when we're talking about eternity of existence, with our trying God, we do have to take that into account as well. In our Gospel reading, Jesus does tell us, do not judge, and you will not be judged. I think somebody's going after that charge. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will not be forgiven. Or you will be forgiven. <laughs> I think this does have reference to that time when we will come before Christ at the end of days. You know that God forgives us for our sins, but Jesus tells us that it is when we forgive that we find forgiveness. I find it interesting how much we crave forgiveness. We want it from God at the same time Jesus is our model. So it just makes sense that we should be forgiving as we expect to be forgiven. You often hear me say, that we are the hands and feet of God. We work to do God's work in the world. Could forgiveness be a part of that work that we do in the world? Not that God would not forgive even if we do not, but by forgiving we lighten the load 
of those who have offended us, of those who are indebted to us, so to speak, helping them to see the possibility of the grace of God. After all, if we sinful humans can grant grace, it is certainty that God above may grant it, and indeed does grant it. And sometimes the awareness of that grace comes through us. But you know, forgiveness is one of the hardest things that you will ever do. No, it is not that hard to forgive those whom we love. It is easy to forgive our children, for example. But people we don't like, well, yeah, that is really hard. And Jesus tells us, if you love those who, you, who love you, what credit is that to you? But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. So how do we do this forgiving thing? I think it is clear that we should recognize that this is often something we can't do on our own. We feel as though we have been hurt or wounded and a person owes us something. If nothing else, they owe us an apology. But like that quarter that was borrowed from me so many years ago, that apology, that restitution, or that compensation may never come. It is tempting to keep that item on our ledger books. It is tempting to obsess over a mere quarter of a dollar, and so our righteousness eats away at us, and the cost of pursuing this debt goes up and gets ever higher. But you know the way to get it off the books? The way to get rid of it is to bring it to God, to pray about it. Say, Lord, send your spirit down upon me and take away this bitterness within my soul. Help me to forgive in the same way that you forgive all of my sins, both great and small. Then search your heart and know that the spirit of God is within you as it is always within you to help you to forgive. And whenever the thought of a debt to you comes into your mind, dismiss it with relief because you no longer have to worry about it. I'm always talking about relationships, as you know. And I think forgiving debts or sins or trespasses, whatever you want to call them, is one of the most important things that we do in preserving relationships with people in the world and among those in the church and among families. And it's also something we do with God. I believe that this is why Jesus was so big on the subject of forgiveness. I mean, forgiveness of sins in one way or another is almost is among the longest threads we find in the warp and weft of the New Testament. It is important for the practical reason that it allows us to live in harmony with others in spite of the occasional unintentional insult or even the occasional misdeed. Forgiveness helps us to live with ourselves because it keeps us from becoming obsessed with retribution. Forgiveness keeps us right with God and helps us to live in God's image. But most of all, it is God's forgiving love for us that makes life as we know it possible. It is what cements our relationships with each other and with our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Eternal and loving God, there is so much in us to forgive, for we act outside the bounds of your commandments every day, in thought, word, and deed. Without your forbearance and the forgiveness of those about us, we would live in constant state of turmoil and destruction. Help us to forgive others as you forgive us. And in this way, may we help preserve peace and harmony among your people. And in the world. Amen.